and she's perfectly placed to give the lecture because she's a tire catcher and a radiologist. So she understands where we're coming from and what we want to see and what we're probably going to ask. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> So, um, I'm also doubly intrigued because part of her talk wouldn't come through and was blocked the bottom content, so I was you know, <laughs> even more intrigued to find out on her slides. So, thank you very much for coming. Um, over to you. Lovely. So, thank you for the introduction. So, as um, Tim has said, I'm a uh, chiropractor and a radiographer, and I have been a chiropractor now for about five years. I worked across many uh, clinics in Bristol and currently working at the Spire for both radiography and uh, chiropractic. So thank you all for attending today. I try not to bore you too much, but uh, there are some contents that just uh, are a bit boring subjects, so we'll try and, uh, try and do our best to try and keep you entertained. So um, this is what we're trying to cover today. So I thought it'd be a good idea to see different imaging modalities that are out there and their specialist role, so each modality has its own specialist role and they are used for diagnosing or looking at different pathologies or conditions so it will be good for you guys to know exactly when you're referring for what exactly um, modality you should be referring for. Most important and the most boring subject, the radiation and animal guidelines. So it is very boring but at the same time it is important for referrers and for practitioners and operators to know about the rules and regulations as to what's important and what's not uh, when you're referring. So this is one thing that is the key thing for the referrers when they are on the referring list. This is what they look for whether you have the knowledge of uh, um, regulations or not. <clears throat> and this is what obviously justifies your request. Um, and then we'll talk about imaging referral pathway. So for non-medical referrals. So there are in the hospital base, there are medical referrers, but for us guys, we're referred as non-medical referrers. So there's a different criteria that is used for us guys to be on their referral list. We'll go through those. And then, um, so just to check whether you have listened to me and whether you've stayed away, there's a little quiz. And then we'll go through some uh, case studies at the end. All right. So list of a few of the modalities that are used. X-rays are the most common ones, and then you get the MRI scans. Does that, anybody know what arthrograms is? Sorry? Scan of the joint. Scan of the joint, yeah. With the dye? The yes, with the dye, yeah. So it's referred to us. We'll go through that because it's quite important <coughs> that we know uh, about arthrograms and things like that. So we'll go through that a little bit more. And then of course, your basic ultrasound scans, so not the ultrasound scans for pregnancy, although they're used for that, but they are now used for musculoskeletal related stuff as well. Um, CTs, I will cover a little bit of CTs, but as non-medical referrers, you may not be allowed to refer for CTs. It's only consultant-led um, for CTs, so, because it is high radiation dose and things like that, so it's, it's mostly consultant-led, but we'll go through CTs as to what CT may be, may be used for, okay? So, what are x-rays? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, uh, uh, radiation fired through a body onto a film. Yay, yes. Oh, or a sensor now. Yeah, so it's, yes it is. So basically there are different um, types of uh, x-rays. So nowadays, I'm not sure if anybody of you have seen the latest uh, digital radiographs that are being produced. No? So you remember the conventional way of like the x-ray films and so... Um, Basically, now we have what we call the digital radiography, so DR system, whereby you get a detector and then you place that detector under the imaging body that's used for x rays and then you fire the radiation beam through that. And then the amount of absorption that happens in the body is referred to as the different densities. So if the body is uh, absorbing a lot of radiation, it will determine the difference. So, for example, uh, it's a chest x ray. So you get different um, density. So for example, your air and gas appears black. So that's your lungs. So because they absorb all that density, it appears black. And then your bone appears whiter because it's the amount of radiation that goes through and then comes up through the other end. And then you get the scattered radiation on the other end. What sort of things would you refer for for an x-ray? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Some arthritis. Yep. 
So yeah, so fractures, dislocations, and then obviously uh, looking at bone degeneration, infections, or tumors. The X-rays are actually quite good at picking up tumors um, because of again the difference in the bone density. They can pick up, although some subtle ones you may need a specialist. Um, bone tumors or other types of tumors. Bone tumors. Bone tumors. Although you can see other types of like soft tissue tumors, depending on the severity and the extent of the tumor. Subtle tumors you, you wouldn't be able to see them. And good at METs or not good at METs? Yes, good at yeah. METs, yeah. But for METs, most often it's something called the nuclear medicine studies. Anybody heard of that? Yeah, yeah so it's the bone density where a dye is taken up and then from a testes and things like that, you normally have the bone scan, which is, which is referred to as the nuclear medicine. So, with any imaging modality, you have goods and bads. So the benefits of it is first line of investigation because this is easily accessible, it's cheaper than other modalities, and it's, it's fairly quick. So um, most often you'll see the GPs, whether or not it's relevant or not, the first they will actually refer you for x-rays straight away. And also because, for example, an x-ray would cost something like 95 pounds, an MRI costs between 200 to 300 pounds. So, which is why it's used as a first line of investigation. And if there isn't anything that shows up on the x-rays, it's normally um, then not taking anything further. No MRIs or CTs are required, but if something you pick up something on the x-rays, that's when the GPs will refer further for further imaging or investigations. The only limitation is ionizing radiation dose. I say ionizing radiation, but with the latest digital equipment, it's very low dose. You actually get more dose from flying than you get from, say, for example, a chest x-ray but it's still ionizing radiation. And you only get 2D images, which is why uh, when patients are sent for an X-ray, you have to do two, two views from looking at different angles. And this is where we'll come up to it later for when a referrer makes a request, they have to specify quite clearly as to what they're looking for. Because in the hospital, from a radiographer's point of view, you will only get one view if your request wasn't sufficient to indicate what you're referring for, hence you may miss a pathology which you may have seen otherwise on, from a different angle. So which is why we we'll come back to in a second as to why it is important to request uh, appropriately. So it's unsuitable for soft tissue and ligament injury, although uh, sometimes, again, it's a high radiation dose to the patient, you can bump up the radiation and if you're looking for some soft tissue, I have done a few x-rays looking at soft tissue of the neck which does mean that you have to increase the radiation dose to the patient, but again, it depends on what sort of uh, requests the referrers ask for and what they want they look at. But most often, you can't see any ligament injuries, and unless it's a complete tear, um, then you'll see you know, the, the, the distance between the bone and the ligament, otherwise you can't, it's not very good at looking at it. Pregnancy. Does anybody know what a 28-day rule is? No, so basically it's to do with your uh, menstrual cycle. So you have to ask them the last day of their first menstrual cycle started, and then you've got to calculate within that 20 days. If they fall within that 20 days, they're safe to have the x-ray, because um, they're unlikely to be pregnant, but if they are not, then um, you, have to, you have to do a pregnancy test. But it's only applicable for any examinations between a diaphragm and knees. So for example, your abdomen, your pelvic x-rays, and your lumbar spine x-rays. Most often, if you are doing extremities, like hands, wrists, and feet, I always check just a precautionary thing for the page, female patients, and it has to be between the ages of 12 and 55. I always check if they are or are likely to be pregnant even though you're x-raying an extremity which is probably like 0.25 um, centigrade of radiation dose compared to like 1.4 for a chest, but you still have to uh, have to check. Magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs. Do you know how they work? They yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, basically it's a high magnetic field do you know what the current um, magnetic field that's being used? It's gone up, hasn't it? Yep. Yeah. 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 Three. Yep, three. Three Tesla. Yeah, so. Three. <laughs> three. <laughs> well there. <laughs> You've done your homework. <laughs> so 1.5 Tesla is standard, but some hospitals do have uh, three Tesla. At the moment, uh, the experiment is being carried on on 
seven Tesla scanners. And it's for mostly for brain, brain tissues because it is so high speed, it's so accurate. Uh, it's a construction of 3D images, it's really good at brain structure, so it's for experimental purposes only. Who in has got a 1.5 who's got a 3? That feels 3, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, Spire's 3. Uh, I think most of the private, uh, the NHS hospital is a 1.5. But um, three, 3 Tesla is that. I think um, Bath have, Bath have 1.5 Tesla. Okay, so the way it works is basically, so you've got the MRI signal, so you've got a computerized uh, um, system on the side, and then you've got a scanner, uh, which then produces the images. So it basically vibrations and it resonates through that, which is what makes the different images. So you've got your auxiliary images, you've got your uh, coronal images, you've got your sagittal images. So it creates different Im images, it resonates through that. And each time it resonates through the whole body, what it does, it picks up signals. So a bit like uh, x-rays, we talked about densities. MRI is intensity. So the vibrational signal that you get back to the scanner is what creates these intensities. Okay, so there's different levels of intensities. So for example, high signal intensity will appear white on the scan. And then the intermediate signal intensity will appear gray and then the low signal intensity will appear black, so then you can differentiate between different structures on the MRI scan. And to confuse the matters more, you've got, uh, anyone familiar with different sequences within the MRI? T1, T2. Yep, T1, T2, and then you've got fat suppressed, um, and you've got contrast studies as well. So with T1 and T2, this will all just likely as well. So that would- What would you use? So T1 and T2, both most common protocols, just general uh, things. But if you're looking at some fatty tissues, for example, then you'll use the fat suppression um, as well. But if you're looking at, uh, say, for example, uh, I don't know, um, your joints, for example, if you're looking at some labral tears or tendons and stuff, so or looking at some uh, tendinopathy, so then you will use the fat suppression contrast studies for uh, T1 and T2 weighted images. So you'll do both of the contrast images, and that's for joints and things like that. So more musculoskeletal related ones. So there's the uh, list. So again, so the ones we are concerned about is T1 and T2. Uh, the rest, uh, I, I just listed to just kind of give you an idea what sort of uh, sequences that we use, but these are most often that we, we are a bit concerned about. So you can see most uh, like angiography, venopathy, cerebrospinal fluid studies, your cochlangiograms, spectral perfusion, most often functional. So this is why I was talking about the 7 Tesla, the <coughs> functional MRI, the 7 Tesla. So lots of uh, different ones. Like I said, we'll go into more detail about T1 and T2. So T1 then, so like I said, it's a part of most of your protocol. This is the standard thing that they will use uh, T1 for because it produces the most anatomical of the image. So here we go. So um, for example, you've got your fluid, which is low signal intensity, and will appear black. Then your muscle with an intermediate signal intensity will be gray. And then your fat, which is the high signal intensity, will be bright. Okay, so inflammation, infection, demyelination will be uh, dark. This will be opposite on the T2 weighted images, apart from muscle. Muscle is just a dark shade of the red, but it stays the same. So um, contrast studies. So like I said, so basically, uh, do you know how our, our programs are performed? Okay, so basically what happens is uh, patients injected with a contrast called the gadolinium, which is the most common uh, contrast medium that's used for, and is safe to use for MRI. Um, so it's used in volumes of maybe five to 15 mils, and is injected intravenously under fluoroscopy. Um, so it's a bit, bit like x-rays, but it's, it's like a CRM and basically you screen as the injection uh, is going in and one is good to uh, locate the site of the needle and then two is to look at the dye is going in the right area that we're looking at most often again is used for things like your shoulders your hips uh, ankles um, and most often joints as well but shoulders most common the shoulders and hip arthrograms are the most common uh, things that can't be picked up on 
your normal x-rays on your normal MRIs, because sometimes things like labral tears or um, slap lesions that are missed on the normal MRI, they will be picked up on the arthrograms because it will show up. So for example, this is your T1 weighted normal MRI scan, and this is with, the, with your contrast. So you can see how the structure, so this is the contrast taken up by the structures and it highlights, it makes it bright. So you can differentiate between the structures. So if there was any pathology, it will be picked up by the, uh, by the way the contrast is taken up. Can, can we refer for an autogram? You can do. Non-medical referrals can do that. You can, but you've got to be, so I'll come back to that in a second, but you, you have to be aware of the safety um, precautions, uh, and, you know, contrast reactions, and whether the patient's safe to go in the, uh, in the MR scanner. But yes, you can, autograms. If you specify that you're wanting to look at, I don't know, uh, you, you've done, you've assessed the patient, and you are thinking that they've got some hip topology that was uh, non-conclusive on, say the patient's had an x-ray scan done, and you want to go straight into the arthrogram, you just say arthrogram studies with contrast, and then the radiographers will know exactly what they do. Each MRI that comes through, that goes, it gets protocoled by the consultant radiologist anyway, they'll look at the request and they'll say, okay, so this is what needs to be done, this is what needs to be done, and they'll just write on it exactly what sort of sequences, what sort of protocol is going to be applied to that imaging, and then the radiographer will perform that uh, imaging according to that. But again, like I said, you've got to specify exactly what you need to do. Is it a lot more expensive to have <coughs> the uh, arthral? Much more. Because it's consultant-led, uh, so you've got the consultant fees, on top of it, so um, say uh, add another 500 on top. So it is. Um, if a patient's happy to pay for it, then uh, then it's different. But most of, or most often they can they can do it through insurance anyway. So, uh, but arthrogram studies are good at looking at looking at what they. So fat suppressor, like we talked about, so it suppresses the bright signal from fat. And like I mentioned earlier, if you're looking at, uh, say for example, fat, and you want to prove that something that you're looking at is definitely fat, then that will, that kind of study is good to kind of prove the sus suspect that you have about those studies. So it's, it's used most often, again, in the, in the joints, just to kind of dif differentiate between the fat and the muscle uh, side of things. So T2. So do you remember what T1 was for fluid? Black, it was black. <coughs> Sorry? Black. Yeah, so it's the opposite. Muscle, as you can see, stays the same, and then the fat is uh, a light, and the inflammation is bright, whereas the T1 was, uh, T1 was dark. So just the opposite of, uh, of T1. Just so you can tell, even without having to look at what the sequence is, you can tell the difference by looking at the different, different structures. And again, you can do the fat spread studies even with the T2-weighted ones as well. So it's looking at like edemas and the soft tissues, or uh, so obviously it makes the fluid stand out a little bit more so you can differentiate between that. But what's good with T2-weighted fat suppression studies is again, you get a lot of uh, signals back from it, so you can tell even the difference between different types of cartilage. So for example, your hyaline cartilage will appear gray, whereas your fibro cartilage will appear black. So it's very good at looking at or differentiating even within different cartilages within the same structure. So which is why they do sometimes these studies if they can't tell the difference. A little summary for you then. So um, for example, your fluid, so like your cerebral spinal fluid, you've got dark on T1 and bright on T2. You've got your muscle, T1 is gray, and T2 is dark gray. And then your spinal cord, you've got gray on T1 and light gray on T2. And then your fat is bright on T1 and light on T2. Your disc is gray on T1 and bright on T2. And then your air is very dark on both of them. And then your inflammation is dark on T1 and bright on T2. There is a quiz at the end, so uh, <laughs> memorize that for slide. <laughs> okay. So, what sort of things you would refer for MRI? Soft tissue. Discs. Discs. Yep, yep. <clears throat> Soft tissue, discs, yep. Anything else? More uh, specific? Inflammation, suspected inflammatory wounds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> okay, so.
So, um, so for, <coughs> for example, if you let torn ligaments, cartilage, rotator cuff, herniated discs, onto necrosis, bone tumors, what I haven't put there actually is your hip pathologies as well. So um, anything in the labral tears and things like that as well. With everything else, we've got benefits and risks. So again, whenever you refer for any imaging, you've got to calculate the benefits and risks and what's good for the patient and what's not and whether you need to do an alternative imaging instead. So um, MRI is pretty safe because it doesn't have uh, ionizing radiation, but it does have a strong magnetic field, strong enough to fling a wheelchair across the room. And it has happened. Even a paper clip, even a hair grip. So it is quite, quite strong. So um, you've got to be aware of it, which is why they, um, I'm not sure, if, has anybody ever had an MRI scan? Yeah. Do they go through all these questionnaires and ask you all this um, over and over and over again? Penetrating eye injury. Penetrating eye injury. Penetrating eye injury. I had yeah. someone that had that. They just stuck their head out of the window and, and a random fleck of metal just went into their eye. We say it hasn't affected his vision or anything, but he's definitely got it. And he was going for an MRI. And he was like, got any metal? He was like, yeah, I've just got something in my eye. Really? Yeah, they checked with that. Yeah, you would have, that would have ripped straight off. Yeah, yeah. So if there's a suspected uh, metal in the eye, so sometimes what happens is I've had a patients come through for an MRI scan, and uh, when they, when the radiographer is going through their safety questionnaires, and then the patient says, yeah, possibly something in my eye, I'm not quite sure, you have to send them for an x ray, because x ray will show up if there is any metal in the eye or not. Because uh, sometimes they do what they call the orbits x ray, so it's just an uh, x ray of the orbits. Um, to see if there is any metal in the eye because it will rip your eye out. Are they really suspicious of powers? Yeah, <laughs> but I think like with everything. So I, I was in the um, few months where I was, I was at Bath and um, I, I just didn't even think about hair grips and I just walked in to the scanner and I stood right next to it and I, was, I could feel a fuzzy sensation <laughs> on my head. And I was like, why am I feeling this fuzzy? And I didn't even think about it. I've taken everything else off. You have to take your badge off, everything. So um, if you, I'm not sure if anybody's been to Circle Bar, but they've got, a bit like um, when you go to the security checks at the airport, they've got the um, beepers basically on either side. So when you walk in, it beeps at you. So it tells you you're not safe to go in. Um, it is super sensitive, so sometimes you are safe to go in and it still beeps green. But if it's red, you're definitely not stepping into that scanner. Um, but other scanners, you can just, you know, I've been, just walked in. And I stood right next to it, we're just positioning the patient, and just press the button for the patient to go in, and I'm like, why am I feeling this fuzzy feeling? Mm -hmm. And then I just stepped back and I said, okay, I'll let you just carry on doing this patient. I'm just going to just step back. Um, I stepped back and I was like, ah. <laughs> I literally took them out, chucked them outside the roof, and I was fine. So this is how sensitive. And even the scanner is constantly on um, because it's, it's not producing an image, but it's got to run because it's, it's just, it, it's really hard uh, and really expensive if the, if the scanner goes into a quenching uh, to kind of re reboot it as such. So it's got to stay on, which is why all the safety, safety precautions. It is very noisy. As the, those of you who've had it, it's very noisy. And depending on what part of the body is being done, if, for example, your neck is being done, you cannot have the headphones on for, uh, if you're having your uh, lower back or your knees or your hips done. They do give you the, um, you know, the earphones just to kind of minimize the noise. But it is up to 120 decibels. So pretty, pretty loud to scanner. Um, so quite deafening. It is time consuming. So normal scan. So your hips, knees, shoulders. Um, it will probably take about 20 to 30 minutes of scanning time, but your arthrograms can take a little bit longer. But then more complex studies like we looked at, like clangiograms and things like that, they can take up to an hour or a couple of hours uh, for some of them. So it, it is quite time consuming. It's quite expensive. So comparing again to an x-ray, it's, uh, it's not modality of choice uh, by GPs by any chance because it comes out to their budget. But if the patient's paying, paying private and they don't want to pay that, then that's, uh, that's okay. Reaction to contrast medium. So again, on the safety questionnaire, if you are injecting contrast or likely to be injecting contrast, you have to check if the patient is uh, likely to have any reaction to it. Um, so especially if they've got any kidney problems or they're on dialysis or they've got any renal failures, all of these things, they need to be mentioned by the referrer um, so that the person who's performing it, they will also ask the patient 
Um, but it's good to uh, measure these things uh, when you're referring through it so that they can avoid contrast. So if patients have had reactions to contrast. <coughs> Um, again, it's pretty safe, um, MRI, so unlike the radiation dose, it's not a radiation dose that's uh, bothersome, although it's not proven, but we normally say to avoid um, doing any MRI scans in the first uh, trimester or so, just because of the heat that's produced, and also because of the noise, and if the patient has to be injected, then that could be, um, could be dangerous for the fetus. So we say avoid it in the first, uh, first four trimester or so. Claustrophobia, so those of you who have had it done, it is quite claustrophobic. I had to press the buzzer to, put a buzzer to come out of the uh, scanner at once. Uh, I was a guinea pig actually. We were just, I was a spherical bath, then we were just practicing some new protocols that we had in the scanner because it was a new scanner we had. And we were just practicing on each other. And uh, I went in head first and uh, they were looking at my uh, neck. Uh, and I, after like, because I think it was long, I was in there longer because they were just fiddling with it. I had to press the buzzer, like, no, I'm coming out now. Mm -hmm. So um, it is quite claustrophobic. Even for people who are not, I'm not claustrophobic, but even I felt quite claustrophobic. Um, but uh, they do do now open scanners. So they are a bit like a CT scanner. Who's had a CT scan? So oh. So CT scan is like a donut. Yeah. Um, so the new MRI scanners, they're they're open both ends and they're quite spacious as well. But um, um, so they make the <laughs> could make it quite airy, quite roomy for people who are claustrophobic. But what sometimes we do do for people who are claustrophobic and we only have a closed uh, traditional MRI scanner, and especially for babies or children. Uh, you do give them some anesthetic to local anesthetic to put them to or general anesthetic to put them to sleep so that one they can stay still and two they they uh, they can um, tolerate the uh, claustrophobia um, and then some people who are really claustrophobic but we have no choice but the traditional MRI scanner you may have to give them um, some anesthetic um, just to kind of get through to the scanner so there are options around it but uh, I think open scanners are becoming a little bit more more popular there are upright scanners as well. But they're not, their image quality isn't as good as the, uh, the traditional MRI scanners. Um, they are used more for so your weight-bearing joints, so for spine, if they're looking at standing and how the weight-bearing compresses on the discs and things. But they, it's, it's traditional MRI scanner. And also people who can't lay flat on their back, you may use the traditional, um, use the upright scanner, but they're not very, very common. And their image quality isn't as good as the traditional MRI scanners. Are there any open scanners in Bristol? Cardiff is the nearest one. Good. Yeah. yeah, it's because they are the only ones, so they make it. They make their money out of it. But it will, they will. I think because there isn't a need for the um, upright MRI scanner as such, um, mm -hmm. I don't. It, it's probably why the you know most of the hospitals haven't even considered buying it because the traditional MRI is so much better because there's only so many things you can do on the upright scanner and most often it is for your spine whereas your traditional scanner is for everything so they, they haven't bothered so they stick with the traditional one. They'll just inject them, put them to sleep, do the scanner and then uh, get them out. Right, okay, so your ultrasound scan. So it's, it's just high frequency radio waves that uh, Basically, you put the jelly on and it goes through, the radio waves goes through the, um, through the body. And again, it's the signal that picks up by the body that produces a very boring 2D image. I don't like ultrasound scans, personally. And yet, I, I, I almost fall asleep if I go in and I have to sit in an ultrasound scan. But um, that's all it is. It, it's actually good for looking at. Um, it's less expensive than your MRI. MRI is a little bit more detailed, but if, uh, if there was something that you were looking at uh, MSK-wise, then ultrasound, you can refer for ultrasound, so looking at your tendinopathies or tears and things like that, you can actually refer for um, MRIs. I've just answered my own question, but. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so rotating cuff tears, uh, synovitis, and things like that. So it, it is used for most of the, uh, basically, everything. And you can do uh, ultrasound-guided injections as well. So uh, when people have joint injections, they can be done under ultrasound or under fluoroscopy. And obviously, uh, ultrasound is safer than fluoroscopy because of the radiation implications with the fluoroscopy side of things. So sometimes, uh, most well, most often, in the hospitals, you'll see the joint injections for pain relief. 
make use uh, for ultrasound for arthrograms can only be done under MRI. So if we suspected an inflammatory arthropathy, would this be our imaging of choice for that? No. So um, you would probably go for an MR. Because there's only so much, again, uh, it will show. If you're looking for very detailed, 3D uh, constructed image, then MRI would be definitely would be, would be the choice. So it's pretty painless, it's non-invasive, it doesn't have ionizing radiation, but there is so much you can, uh, it doesn't detect any loose bodies or anything like that, it's literally just looking at that. But the thing is, it's not very specific, so if um, ultrasound will tell you that there is a tear, but it wouldn't tell you exactly the, the location and the specificity of the depth of them, whereas the uh, MRI scan because of the reconstruction of different sequences. So, like we've got the axial, you've got the sagittal images. You can look at it from different angles and 3D it, and then you will know exactly what it is and and how how the depth of the tear is and whether it's complete rupture or not. So then, if we're suspecting um, something that's minor but also significantly present, is that why you would then? Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. we're more likely to get a yes from the GP. So yeah. how much does that cost? So that's probably about 170 to 200 pounds again, depending on where you are. Okay, so. Because it's the because they are consultant led. If the patient went to NHS, for example, there are a lot. Well, the patient doesn't have to pay anything, but because in the hospital. They, in the private hospitals, they are consultant-led. This is where the consultants yeah, make their money. Yeah, but if we're referring an NHS patient to their GP with a suspected minor tear in yeah. their blood muscle, that's the cheapest yeah. Yeah. image that would provide enough information. Yeah, exactly. Better than x-rays. Yeah. yeah. So definitely, yeah, that route. And also, GPs are in more likely to refer for an ultrasound scan than they are for an MRI scan. From a budget. Yeah. It seems the wrong way around though sometimes, doesn't it? Because if they see something that's more significant on that, they then have to scan again. At GPs, top. no GPs here, right? Basically, they, they don't think like that. They just think, oh, it's just, uh, I don't know, 75 pounds for uh, an x-ray. It's just a 75 pounds. I'm just going to refer you for it. Sometimes they do that just to keep the patient happy. Mm -hmm. Because it says, right, okay, I've done something for you. It's the cheapest of the option, but it makes you feel as if I've done something for you. And then they take no action afterwards. Um, whereas if they, one, there's a waiting time, because patients sometimes, from a patient's point of view, they're, they're a bit hasty, and they want things done now. So x-ray is the only one that you can get it done now. Because if you, um, if you if a GP refer, nowadays it's an electronic referrals. So basically, GP refers electronically. Patient can um, turn up at the local hospitals um, anytime between I think it's eight and four. Depending on how busy they are, they may have to wait a little bit, and they can get their X-ray done on the same day, even over the weekends. But if it's an ultrasound, patient has to wait. Uh, because the GP has to refer to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Hospital has to then look at the request, justify it, and approve it, <coughs> whether the examination can go ahead or not. Then it goes to the secretaries. Secretaries then look at their diary, and then they then send an appointment letter to the patient to say, come on that day, we have a, a little gap there, so we can squeeze you in then. And depending on how busy they are, um, it could sometimes it can take up to three months before they can get their first appointment. Quicker than MRI, but still there is a bit of, because MSK ultrasound is becoming quite popular, it's actually uh, becoming a lot harder to get in than it used to. So, you, go on, sorry, no. Be finished. Yeah. So, you seem to be saying skip this, good MRI, um, uh, but are there some things that you, like I've always sort of thought, um, label tears and slap lesions. I thought it's sort of good in those areas. Or it is, it is. But I'm just saying that if you, if the patient is happy to pay, I would always refer them for an MRI. That that would be my first choice because it's so much information, so detailed. It shows ligaments, it shows your tendons, it shows your muscle. Basically, everything is on there on one image. 
whereas Alkasan shows you some information for you to go on to your next step to decide what you want to do next, but it doesn't give you everything in, in one picture. But obviously if the patient said, oh no, I can't afford to have an MRI scan done privately and they don't have medical insurance, then at least you have the choice of sending them to the GP for them to at least get something done which, which is a little bit more detailed than an x-ray. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So your CT then. So again, it's a computerized tomography which is just one step from your x-rays. So it's quite detailed uh, cross-section images. They're very quick. They're literally five, 10 minutes in out kind of thing. And they're uh, often um, used to visualize the size and the shape and the position of the structure. So basically it shows your bone uh, really well. So CT is really look good at looking at, look at any bone pathologies and location of that structure. So I've given you some hints. What sort of clinical indication would you refer for CT? Yeah. Yes, head scans, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at that skull. Yeah. Would stenosis short well on this? Like spinal stenosis? Um, I, again, MRI would be choice of modality for that one, of CT. No? Okay. So, basics, but you've got your trauma, which is the big one for CT. So if, for example, a patient's been in a road traffic collision and they've been strapped on a trolley and they come to the A&E, CT would be the first thing that would be done. Because it shows the fractures and look at the size of the fracture really well. And it's really good. Because it's 3D reconstruction, it actually shows you exactly the location of the fracture as well. So it's really good at looking at organs as well. As, uh, so, um, as well as, but it's big one for trauma, which is basically your A&E runs or CT scans. It's constant head scans, full body scans uh, on CT, which is why we wouldn't really, we wouldn't really get, uh, for a non-medical referral side of things, we wouldn't really get involved in CTs. Um, and if you do, you would have to go through a GP or a consultant for them to refer because of high radiation dose it has compared to a normal, normal X-ray. <coughs> would you um, use this, let's say you thought someone might have METS, history of cancer, back, back pain, would you go for this above an MRI for that? Yes. Because it, CT, so I was just coming on to the positive transmission tomography, which is actually used um, as a diagnostic and a therapeutic. So you can locate the site and the size of the tumour, as well as use it to fire up electrons to treat it as well. So um, it's, it's PET scans are really, uh, CT scans are really, really good at both diagnosing and treatment. So it's basically a tracer that's injected into the body and it's, it's the a tracer just basically traces up the body and they can kind of visualize uh, the areas where they're looking at. But yeah, so tumors are really, the CT is really good at picking up uh, tumors and that sort of things. But again, if you were suspecting METs, then uh, nuclear medicine would be better than, than the CT. But again, that would have to be done through to their uh, GP and then onto their oncologist, but oncologists would re refer them for that anyway. What do you mean by nuclear medicine? As if that, that's that's a different modality, so that's the bone, bone scan. So if you were suspecting METs in a patient, I would just send them to the GP. Yeah, and not and specify to... imaging, just... Well, you can, but GP will probably most often send them for an x-ray first and then they will refer them to an oncologist who would then do a CT um, scan or a most often nuclear medicine scan. Especially if it's METs because nuclear medicine is really good at looking at your metastases. Okay. But if you if you suspected something then I would I would send them <coughs> uh, send them to a GP rather than sending them through because uh, they're probably going to have loads of images done throughout their time, so it's probably better to go through the GP route. Do you suspect that it's also a normal x-ray, but they had a non-healing fracture or a stress fracture, would that be? If they had a normal x-ray? Yeah, stuff's not showing up. Yeah, it can do, which is why, so coming back to that skateboard person, um, so sometimes uh, if there is a stress fracture, which is a very subtle fracture, 
sometimes you have to allow for it to like at least 10 days or so before you can send them for images because it takes that sort of time for the fracture to show up on the x-ray. So for example, um, Perry had a patient who was suspected uh, stress fracture uh, and the scapegoat. She, um, she had a, an injury which uh, she was still having troubles with. So scapegoats, normally we say it's a 10 day rule you can send them for images. Yeah. Unless, unless the patient presents with localized pain and tenderness over the scapegoat area and it's only tender over the scapegoat area, that's only and only when we will do scapegoat views. Because the normal wrist views are different to scapegoat views. We do four different views looking at four different angles of looking at the scapegoat, open up the joint a uh, little bit more because it shows up on the scapegoat. But if you were doing just a normal wrist, it would just be a deep and natural, natural view. So your patient falls over, hurts I'll the wrist, stretch. and you go in the anatomy and stuff whilst it hurts. Uh, would you then send play any with a scape, question of the scapegoat? Yeah. Would, you wait, would you then wait or would you go straight? No, if, if it's localised tenderness over the scapegoat area, you would write, uh, you would send and say, query scapegoat fracture. If you put query scapegoat fracture, tenderness, and if you specify why you've asked for scapegoat views, because if I looked at it from a radio point of view, I'd be like, well, they've had a fall. Why are you asking me to do scapegoat views? Look at the wrist first. I'll just do re I'll give you just wrist views, and I'll just do a DP and a lateral view. But if you say specify that actually the tenderness is localized over the scapegoat, and there is no other pain anywhere else, which is why you want to concentrate on the scapegoat, and I'll be like, right, okay, so it makes sense. I'll uh, I'll do this. A in fact, I had a patient um, has uh, in the radiology a couple of days ago. And the patient presented uh, with pain, um, quite a diffuse pain actually, over the uh, over the hand and wrist area. And the person who'd requested, they'd asked for a hand, so they requested two x-rays, one hand x-ray and one a wrist x-ray. I then questioned the referrer as to why you're asking for hand and wrist views. Um, and then they said because of the diffuse. And I said instead of doing hand view, I just combined the hand and wrist views together to minimize the radiation dose to the patient. So, because otherwise you end up doing, instead of doing four views, I just did three. So it's just, again, depending on what, what sorry, the clinical indications are really important. I have rejected uh, requests before just because they don't have sufficient information on it. And it's just a waste of patient's journey. And sometimes they've even requested an incorrect side. <laughs> so uh, you're like, no, sorry. To go back, it's just wasteful uh, for the patient. The patient gets to it's a one unhappy patient, but I've got to do you know, because it's radiation, I've got to do what's, uh, what's best for the patient. It's hard when it's the uh, weekend because you can't really ring up the GP. I always try my best to try and help the patient. I would always call up the GP and say, Did you actually mean this side rather than the other side? Check your notes, and then if they can fax through a new request form, you I'm happy to proceed with the examination. But over the weekend, um, you've got no, no chance, so you have to send the patient away, I'm afraid. Okay, so comparison then. So you've got 2D images with x-rays, but 3D with MRI and CT. So your x-rays, they show up bones and joints and trauma and injuries, but again, you get a bit more detail. So you get the exact location and size of tumor, for example, it's more useful for severe injuries. Whereas your MRI is there for your ligament, tendon, um, discs, lig uh, spinal ligaments, muscles, joints, bones. Um, so it's good at visualizing those things because of like the three D structure. Um, so you've got a small ionizing dish, those with X rays, a bit more with the CT and no radiation at all with MRI scan. Um, so it's very quick, literally within minutes, depending on what part of the body is being X rayed. Um, so again, about 10 minutes max, I think, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on, again, what is um, being seen or looked at, and long scan times with MRI. CT is actually being used for now for injections as well. So uh, a bit like our programs for the MRIs, CT is now actually being used so instead of using the philosophy to guide uh, and locate the location of the needle so you know exactly which area you're injecting the dye in, CT is actually being used for that now and they actually just go in and do it under CT rather than injecting it under fluoroscopy and then taking the patient to MRI. They're just doing it all under, under CT now. So it's become a little bit more popular looking at that. 
And how much does it cost? CTE, yeah, Normal CT would probably be about £170 to £200. So not much difference between CT and MRI, but um, it's slightly cheaper than MRI. But again, if it is um, injecting dye in, then it will be a little bit more dearer. How much more radiation is it? Is there a limit of CT? There is no limit as such, but it is quite, quite more than... So for example, if a wrist is, I don't know, 0.24, um, centigrades for an x-ray that would probably be like 2.4 centigrades on the CT so it's a little bit more than that but again compared to I, I say radiation dose but actually you probably like I said you probably get more radiation dose for if you're a frequent flyer um, you know you get more radiation dose um, and actually um, from eating Brazil nuts you get a lot more radiation dose than an x-ray. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Oh, it's just the, the amount of radiation it has in natural radiation. Well, just look yeah. at them in the dark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They'll work in the dark. So, um, yeah, I love Brazil. So, I'm still eating them. Um, wow, that's quite a fact. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I eat a lot of them. Yeah. 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 So, Harry, you might want to wear your CLT badge. Going back to the metal thing, do you think there are any that can't go anywhere? Yes. So this is the boring topic, I'm afraid, but uh, it's something that we have to uh, we have to cover. Um, so ionizing radiation, medical exposure. I thought you were going to leave that as like I just. So it's not that boring. <laughs> um, so Irma. Um, so basically, each hospital has what we call uh, local rules uh, and safety of procedures, which every one working within that hospital has to adhere by. Even the referrers, whether they are hospital-based referrers or external referrers, they have to be aware of these uh, safety protocols. And they're there to protect the patient, they're there to protect your carers and comforter, but comforters. Your comforters are people that stay in the room with the patient. So for example, if I, uh, if I had a child who I wanted to x-ray for a hand, and the patient um, is, I don't know, two and a half years old, and they can't sit on their own uh, very still, so I would have to get their, whoever is presenting with the patient, have to get them to stay in the room. And in order for them to stay in the room, I have to make sure that if it's a female patient, they're not pregnant, and if they are, um, if they are staying in the room, they have to wear a lead apron, so they are protected from the radiation dose. And in fact, when we do fluoroscopy images, so when we do a joint injections under uh, X-rays, or if we're working in theatre, we all have to wear lead aprons um, to protect ourselves from radiation dose. So these are the safety protocols to make sure that everyone uh, at his own each room has a certain local rules that make sure that they are followed. So. 10 and 20 day rule. So we talked about the 28 day rule, which is used for normal x-rays. 10 day rule is used for CT scans. Because of high radiation dose, so for example, if you're looking at the abdomen or pelvis or lumbar spine, then you've got to make sure the female patients between the ages of 12 and 55, um, they are safe to go in, uh, the, uh, in the CT scanner. And if they're not, uh, if they're unsure, then you have to send them for a pregnancy test and confirm they're not pregnant before you can put them in the ultrasound in the CT scan. But sometimes you have to uh, weigh out benefit and risks. I did have a patient who was like, she was, I think she was due like two weeks and she presented to the x-rays uh, for her, she'd fallen over and she'd hurt her wrist and they were looking at fractures. And so we had to go back to the referrer and discuss what the benefits and risks. And uh, in the end, we decided that we were going to x-ray her. And if there was a fracture, we will put a cast on before her delivery date. And this is exactly what happened. So it, it's, it's basically down to the referrer to decide whether they want that imaging done despite whether they're pregnant or not. So sometimes this is important for you guys to know when you're referring for um, an imaging. Uh, whether what, what's the benefit, whether it outweighs the risks or not. Okay, what are the four? Does anybody know what the four duty holders are under Irma? Any guesses? What does that mean? mean? So people <laughs> that people that are responsible for uh, within within the clinical setting, basically, for um, safeties of uh, operators, patients, carers. 
and, and the individual. So yeah, so the employer, the referrer, the practitioner, and the operator. So basically, the employer is responsible for setting the procedures like we talked about, and they have set a framework, safety of procedure protocols and things that we, they have to make sure the written procedures that everyone follows. Uh, and they've written quite clearly um, so that everyone knows exactly what to do, how to do certain procedures. Um, and they are responsible for all of these people. So the referrers are basically under the employer. So employers set uh, some protocols to make sure the referrers are doing what they're doing. Um, and they have to go through safety protocols to make sure they, they basically sit in their good books. And the referrer, as I suggest, is, is anybody uh, is a you know, health professional who refers uh, for any imaging modality. So again, they have to make sure that they adhere to any frameworks or written procedures and protocols set by the employer, okay? which is a bit more for non-medical referrers, which I will go uh, in a bit more detail in a moment. So practitioner and operators can be the same person. So for example, at times, I'm acting as a practitioner and an operator because I'm justifying the medical exposure and I'm performing the actual procedure. And other times, uh, for example, in the NHS, not so much in the private uh, hospital settings, but in the NHS, you have a dedicated person, a radiographer, who sits there um, as a couple of hours a day to go through uh, wetting the information that comes through. So any uh, information, uh, any requests that come through the GPs, consultants, any referrers that send the request through, they will sit through it and they will um, protocol it and basically they will say whether this procedure can go ahead or not. And then if, if they're rejecting any procedures, they'll bounce back to the referrer. Whereas in the uh, private setting, you do, you do that basically there and then. Um, so like I said, operators, obviously, radio who carries out any uh, medical exposure. So they are the ones that are responsible for um, saying, yes, I'm going to do this x-ray, or no, I'm not going to do this, because again, it's a safety procedure for the patient. At the end of the day, uh, under the ERMO regulations, you've got to keep the dose as low as reasonably practicable. So what I like of saying to the example of the wrist and the hand, it's my responsibility to make sure that I'm giving as low dose as possible to the patient and whether the request is justified for me to even go ahead with the procedure or not. Because if they're not, um, and I was directly the patient, then I'm the one who's going to be standing in the court answering. Because I'm the liable person pressing that button. So, non-medical referrers then. So you've got, nowadays you have the extended role, which is any allied health professionals or nurses um, requesting x-rays, um, but they have to be trained. So any referrer that uh, is put on that, their name appears on the list of referrers, they have to go through some extensive training to make sure that they comply with the ERMA regulations. So again, everything comes down to patient safety. So make sure that they're safe to request what then they they work under their scope of practice and they get audited. They have to have their training uh, every three years. Um, and then the audit basically makes sure that they're working within their scope of practice and that they are doing what they, what they were told they were doing. If not, they can be removed from the register as such. So you get different types of referrers. So you've got us as non-medical referrers requesting images, but you also go within the team setting. You've got uh, your um, people like your nurses and your physiotherapists that are working within a team and within the hospital that request x-rays, but somebody else looks at them and reports on the x-rays. And then you've got people like um, medical secretaries and orthopedic nurses that again work within a hospital setting whereby the consultant sees the patient, um, they request the x-ray, the, basically the um, secretaries are just transcribing these notes and they request these x-rays and they are set under non-medical referrers. And then you've got your autonomous practitioners which are your uh, medical um, imaging referrers working in the uh, minor injuries. So they are the only ones that can request read their own x-rays so that they can provide patients with appropriate um, um, management basically so if in the minor injuries if they saw something they can 
we can treat the patient, triage the patient before the official report is printed out. So but in our case, we will have um, we will have requesting out to the hospital for the X-ray. We will have the radiologist looking at the X-rays and we'll get the reports of our uh, requesting imaging. Did someone yeah, have can, can we make that request then? We haven't had this training. So can we make that request direct? So, so we have to go through, if, they, if they've got private healthcare, we still go through the GP? Yes, yeah, so we? you can go through the GP, but if the, so some hospitals, which I was uh, talking to Harry about, so I'm just talking to Spire at the moment. So what we're going to do is set up a, um, a referral pathway for you guys, so mm -hmm. that, um, so it might be an in-house training, or it might be an online training that you may have to complete, just for the sake of the certificate, to say you understand the safety protocols and the rules and regulations under IRMA and that you are and then if they give you I have actually made the application on behalf of us um, to Aspire um, and it's just going through because it has to go through the radiation committee board um, they're just viewing the application for now and then they will let us know whether we can be there on their list of uh, non-medical non -medical referrals. How would the airline prefer to the Bath Imaging Partnership then? Sorry? The Bath Imaging Partnership takes referrals from us, how is that? It's, it's each individual um, hospital is different. So if they are happy for you, so like I said, if they're happy for you to be on their referring list, then that's fine. But if some hospitals are a little bit more picky because they have to make sure that you adhere to the rules and regulations set by. So like I said, each, each hospital, they have their own local rules and they have to, every, everyone, all of the uh, people that are duty holders have to comply with those rules. Some hospitals like BMI Bath or Bath Imaging Partners, they, as long as you are a, um, you know, allied health professional, you, are, you become a referral automatically. Does that make sense? I've been asked to do the IRMA training by the health people. So yeah. where can I access that at the moment? Did they not give you a link? No. Okay. So basically, um, if they tell you to do the IRMA uh, regulations, then you they normally give you a link to uh, you know an online training, or they may hold training at their place that you can go and attend. Um, so I would go back to them and say, you've said I need to do over training, which is what I was referring to earlier when I said about the spire. So when I come back, so if they do that, they might. Yeah, I did um, ask them and they don't. So not training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Waste time. Yeah. Um, I wonder if, because the BCA have set up a, a course, haven't they? And I wonder if the IO are going to bug them for a course, mm -hmm. really. I don't, I don't know, is it this individual? Uh, every hospital's got individual sort of yes. criteria and protocol. I don't know if it's, it's going to be worth doing an IO one or a, because then you, if that might not, you know, apply to all the individual hospitals. I think it does though. Is that, I think, yeah, I think yeah. It, yeah. that's the idea. Yeah, so can. once you've got the, um, the certificate as such, you can just present the certificate and say, I understand the other. It's, it's basically. So if you didn't love them, can you then go to the spa? Yeah. Yeah, you just present say, look, I have this Irma, um safety training that I've completed, and uh, they'll just look at it. They may ask you to do an hour or so of another online stuff if if they think necessary, but otherwise they might say that's sufficient for you to go on our referral list, which is why I'm um, um, talking to Spire about. So basically, I spoke to the uh, radiation committee board to say uh, whether people can refer to Spire. And uh, so the application has been made. So the um, head of the committee, I, I basically wrote a letter and sent in some application form and submitted it. So they have a meeting once a month. Uh, they missed the last one because of the holidays and things. So they've got another one coming up, and that's when they will decide uh, what they're going to do next. And I've already spoken to the hospital director at Spire to say what sort of. So they, they, the hospital director is happy for us to have as the non-medical referrers, it just has to be approved by the medical committee, which is being looked at at the moment. And if they, if they, and then I will talk to them whether we need some sufficient training, whether that's provided on site or whether that's done, because we do have what we call the radiation protection advisor, uh, which comes in just training for us, so it could be uh, for radiographers, so it could be the same sort of person that does the training for you. Yeah, sure. I, I'm just waiting to hear back from the committee. I emailed them actually before I uh, last week to say what the outcome was, and the person who's dealing with it said the committee board, one of the head member, he is uh, off on holidays when he comes back. We'll hold another meeting. We should find out. Okay. 
Okay, so this is basically what um, I was talking about. So basically, the any training requirement, you've got to make sure that you understand what radiation protection principles are. Although you're not going to be referring for CTs, you still will be referring for x-rays, so that's where the radiation comes from. MRI is not a big issue, ultrasound is not a big issue, it's the x-rays that, because of the, even though it's a small radiation dose, and that you understand those risks which I talked about earlier, you understand the benefits and risks, so, so especially if you're referring for a, say, uh, an MRI scan, you understand the contraindications and the implications of a patient having uh, metallic objects and how that's going to have an impact, and that you're aware that patient does have it and to warn, warn the uh, examiner, but also you are aware of other alternatives, so for example, CT or, or ultrasound scans, um, and that you understand your responsibility. So it says about spending time with the imaging modality, so it may be that you may have to come and spend, I don't know, a couple of hours in the imaging modality um, just to kind of see what exactly happens and what sort of things you're looking for and why you're referring, just to get an idea of what sort of things happen. Um, and then obviously the local referral pathway, so which I, I'm just kind of um, trying to sort out at the moment, so I'll come back to you guys once I know what's happening with that one. So as, as, as well as the training requirements, you have the clinical governance requirement, which is where, where the tricky bits comes about when you're field asking for the IRMA uh, requirements, because it's, it's not the hospital, it's the clinical governance that asks for these. But so when the CQC come and make a visit, they have a list of referrers, and then they see uh, whether these referrers have had adequate training and to be the referrers for the hospital. So it's basically for the sake of CQC to make sure they have the correct paperwork, so for the clinical government side of things. So it's uh, basically, which is why you have to have the training, you have to have the audits, um, continuing professional development, uh, mentors, and you understand the local referral guidelines, and you understand about high dose examinations, which is CTs, and CTs are mostly consultant led anyway, so you couldn't directly be referring for CTs and have to go through <coughs> the GPs. Um, and then you understand about MR referrals and the safety implications for that as well. Happy? Boring, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, so uh, just to give you a quick guideline as to what sort of protocols uh, you may see in the primary care sector. So basically, you have uh, your body part, so lumbar spine. So a patient may have low back pain um, with some adverse symptoms or signs or more serious stuff like cordial quina. This is an urgent uh, MRI referral, either through e uh, AME or through neurosurgery route. But this one can be um, urgent or it could be just depending on, again, if it's just a chronic low back pain. It could just be a standard MRI, but if they've got other ridiculous symptoms, then you may have to think about referring them for an urgent MRI. And this is what you have to specify on the request form when you're writing urgent MRI requested because of such, 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 such. Because if you just put low back pain, uh, query, I don't know, um, disc, MR, that's not urgent, that can wait three months. But if you put ridiculous symptoms, you're concerned about prolapse discs or herniated, herniated discs, and this is an urgent MR referral, you're more likely to get the patient having the appointment come through much quicker. Sorry, how would you differentiate between referring for an MRI versus a CT scan with lower back pain? If the patient would split that would some always loads. be a, For me, that would always be an MRI. Unless they had contraindications that they couldn't go in MRI because they had some, I don't know, they've got a pacemaker or they've got some, um, um, I don't know, some heart rub or they've got some um, some stuff in the uh, in the brain that they've had some procedure done. That's when they would say, right, okay, we'll have a CT scan. But most often it okay. will be MRI. I've just got it written down here, CT scans, tumours. Big flashing lights on the page. That's all. Tumors, yes. Yeah. But this is just if you were if but if you specify this for tumors, then yes. But if you're just saying low back pain, yeah. Then I would I would send them for an MRI okay. scan because you're looking at you're potentially looking at the disc. But if you're saying a uh, patient's having some low back pain and you're concerned that they may have some tumors, then yes, send them okay. for a CT scan. So same with the thoracic spine. So again, if they've got some um, track signs or they've got ridiculous pain, then MRI um, urgent or again, depending on what sort of symptoms they're, they're recommending, then that would be depending on if there's a standard MRI or an urgent MRI. So your, 
extremity. So for example, if there's just an acute knee pain, patient just presented with acute knee pain, you would send them for a plain x-ray first. But if you've got, um, if they've had trauma and you're looking for um, ligamentous or um, uh, injury, tendon injury, then I would send them for, for an MRI. Same with the ankle or foot pain. So if it's just looking at chronic ankle or foot pain, just seeing the extent of uh, arthritic changes, then you would send them for an, uh, for an x-ray first to kind of find out exactly what the bone pathology is and whether it's just arthritis. But if you're looking for more um, like a sprain uh, or ligament, then you would send them for, a, for an MRI to exclude the ligamentous injuries. For anything other than that, so like tendinopathies, uh, mortal neuroma, then you would send them for ultrasound. Same, shoulder, so first line of investigation would be x-rays, so if you're looking at just the joint degeneration or any bony abnormalities, um, but otherwise if you're looking for any tendinopathies or tears, then you would send them for an ultrasound, but if you want more specific information on uh, anything to do with tears or, or um, tendon, tendon um, apologies, then you have to send them for an MRI scan. Same with our bar, um, elbows, so ultrasound to look at things like tenosinitis or bicep tendon pathology or soft tissue lumps, but again, more specific for the MRI scans to look at more, more detailed pathology. Wrist, so ultrasound again, first choice of uh, investigation for looking at soft tissues or lumps, uh, but then MRI if you're looking for any tendons or ligamentous um, disruptions. Okay. Is it possible to be emailed the referral criteria? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It goes on the site. It goes on the site. Oh, you have emailed. Well, yeah. Absolutely fine. See, there's so far there's no content that's. Uh, <laughs> it's coming though. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Ready. <laughs> have I kept you awake? Yes, yeah, yeah. very well. Okay, so here we go then. Gosh, I can't do this. What imaging is this? Alright. So, which one's T1, which one's T2? T1, T1. This one is? T1. Well done. Okay, so, what's number one? Yeah, what's number two? Muscle. Muscle. Yeah, what's number three? Yeah, what's number four? What's number five? And what's number six? Uh, okay. <laughs> you did stay away. What part of body is this? <laughs> well done. Okay. <laughs> yes, hip. What imaging modality? Yep. Who said arthrogram? Yep, arthrogram. Is it normal or abnormal? Abnormal. <laughs> abnormal. What's the abnormality? Um, Sorry? Sorry? Cam lesion. Is it femoral neck compression? It's normal actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the needle. So our program, so they inject it. This is the dye that's just <coughs> taken up in the uh, joint space. What's the black arrows? Mm -hmm. That's just the anterior joint capsule and that would be the posterior joint capsule. It's just the way the joint. Uh, Contrast has been taken up by the joint. Can you just go back? What's the fuzzy bit on the. Uh, Which one? Uh, above the needle. Yeah. This bit. This is the contrast. No, no, the, um, just your right. That, that bit. bit. That bit. Yeah. But that's just the contrast taken up a little bit more in the joint capsule and it's kind of radiating across there. Okay. Imaging modality? Okay. Ultrasound CT. MRI actually. Mm -hmm. MRI of the body part? Ankle. Ankle. Yeah, well done. Okay, so normal abnormal. Like quite honest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, 
It's a normal MRI actually. <laughs> <laughs> normal MRI of the uh, ankle. So the red joints, I'm looking at your tailor navicular joint, or the ligament rather, just there. And this is the contrast that's being taken up. Okay? And then same with that one here. So this is, you've got your talus bone here, so head of talus. You've got your cuboid, and then you've got your calcaneus here. And then so just the uh, contrast taken up basically. And then this is the uh, tendon that runs across there. So the contrast in that case is showing the joint strength. Yeah, so it's basically just normal. Sometimes it gets taken up a little bit more. It's normal, normal variant. A bit like x rays, you know, when you find a normal variance. So it's just normal, normal variant. So yeah, that was just to trick you, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, all right. Imaging modality? Sorry? Oh, um, did I hear MRI? Right? Yeah, don't be hesitant. <laughs> what body part? Leg. Uh, no, it's not. Blue <laughs> oh, um, so was in the things. previous image. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what's the uh, white arrow? Oh, first of all, no one are abnormal. Oh, no, I don't. No, I don't. Oh, and let me help you out. It's normal. Okay. So this is the talus. So looking at the talus bone here. So the white arrow is just looking at your talus navicular joint, and where it bifurcates basically. So just from three different images. So this is your sagittal. This is your coronal, so again, different different angles there to show you it's slightly different. It's just looking at your ligament and how that is taken up. Okay? You did well. <laughs> okay, so 24 years old professional soccer player with left hip pain. What are you gonna what what are your thoughts? Are you gonna send it for referrals for imaging? Uh, like X-ray first. X-ray first, MRI. With contrast. Contrast. Yeah, okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> okay. What are you looking at? What are you? What are you? What are you potential diagnosis or differentials? Well, what are the uh, yeah. symptoms? Yeah. Just, just that tip pain basically. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Muscle pain. Avulsion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. So an MRI was done. This is an MRI scan. What can you see? This time I told you what the imaging is. I've given you one clue. Is this it? <laughs> is it a T1 or T2 image? One. T2. T2. So what? Blue arrows, guys? Well, there's a disturbance. There's something. So what are the yeah? What are the blue arrows? Ligamentous teres. All your attachment. So basically, just there. You see that now? You see that dip? It's only when can someone point it out. So, you've got a teenager, she's a ballerina, and comes to you with snapping sensation of her right hip. You're going to send it for an imaging? Am I right? Of a snap out of it. <laughs> okay, so it's a uh, an art program. It's a T1 image. 
What can you see? Okay. Good Lord. Yep. <laughs> so basically, where the, remember the contrast, where the contrast isn't taken up, that's where the topology is. So it, can you see the circular area? But here, there's a break in where the um, contrast isn't being taken up. So it suggests. Yeah. Yeah. Table 10. So, 65 years old female with poor and twisting inversion injury of her ankle. <coughs> X rays. X rays. Yay. What are you suspecting? Yep. So, she had an X ray done. And then she had an MRI scan done after. Do you know why? She read contraction of ocean. Yeah, so it's an avulsion fracture. So they wanted, so th this is what I mean. So x ray is so 2D, it only shows you that she's got an avulsion fracture, but it doesn't actually show you where, whether there is any, what the extent of the tear of that ligament is, and whether there is a partial tear or a complete tear, which is why then she went on to have the MRI scan done. So again, you can see. So this is your avulsion fracture, and this is where the disruption to her ligament is. But good job she did have the MRI scan done, because when they did, oh, let's just show it, tells you where it is. So you've got the uh, tear, or the avulsion fracture, and then you've got the um, edema as well, in the dorsal tennis. So the second image that was done, so again, different, cross-sectional image, so that was the coronal and sagittal views, and she's got something else happening, as well as what we discussed. So if, if that's your talus, and that's your cuboid, what runs under there? Yeah, so you've got, she's got calcaneal cuboid ligament as well. So in the calcaneal cuboid ligament tear as well. So this is why MRI is good at looking at what is good at looking at, because they would have missed all of this had they not referred that. They probably would have just thought, yeah, partial tear of the ligament, she's got a motion fracture, but they would not have seen the external damage that she had done to her ankle. Ready for the next one? Mm -hmm. So 77 years old female with insidious onset pain and swelling in ankle for about a week. X-ray. Boston X-ray scan. Yes. <laughs> a DEXA scan. Video. So she went straight for an MRI scan, and da da da. What does it show? So again, we've got your cuboid, we've got your talus, we've got your uh, mortis joint. So if that's the talus and that's the cuboid and that's the navicular bone, that's it. Clue is in the names of the bones. Is it sophistication? Yeah. So it's a talonavicular and calcaneal cuboid ligament injury. So calcaneal cuboid and talonavicular. I think the problem is most of us don't have good enough normal ones to know the avenue. That's normal ones. The thing is, you've got to see the contrast. That's it. You can see where the, con where the uh, signal is uh, brighter. So obviously the pathology will be where the signal is brighter. So you can see, suddenly the signal changes. You can see that break in there. So that's the change in the signal. And there as well. So wherever you see, so see that's darker, the rest is lighter. So wherever there is, and this is, there's a lighter patch in here, can you see that now? Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of it is quite uniform. So wherever there is a change in signal in MRI, that's where the pathology normally is. Okay, so 75 years old male with one year knee pain. They, he had x-rays and then he had them 12 months later because the initial ones were um, just shown as arthritis and cyst in his tibia. <coughs> so these were his original ones. Wow. 
<laughs> yeah. Can you see anything else apart from the osteoarthritis? Like a cartilage on the medial compound. Yeah. So it's quite disrupted, isn't it? And then these were the ones that were done 12 months later. Oh. What's going on in the bone there, the, 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 in the top of the tibia there? It's it's like bone erosion. Yeah. Do you know what that is? It's, it's an osteolytic cancer. I couldn't actually get the um, MRIs uh, for this patient. But that was diagnosed after patient. So this was done, and then an MRI was done, and then this was done. Um, so basically, they completely missed it. Had they not done the MRI scan, they wouldn't have known that there was a chondrosarcoma of the proximal tibia. So basically, the initial MRIs were just diagnosed as OA, extreme OA, and then until mm -hmm. MRI, they, they revealed the tumor infiltration, and then they took some biopsies, and then that's what happened 12 months later. Exactly, this is what I mean. Like sometimes. Pathologies can be missed on the initial, which is why you've got to follow up with the, if, if the patient's still suffering the symptoms, you've got to follow it up with other imaging modality, because one imaging modality, you, you're more likely to miss it. Which is why sometimes um, x-rays, like for fractures, subtle fractures, you have to do them 10 or two weeks later, because initial x-rays will be normal, and then you may have a, an x-ray um, two weeks later, and the actual fracture is shown, and it has happened, I've seen it happening. So uh, sometimes you've got to follow up with these uh, images and investigations. What body parts um, does that rule apply to? All. All. Yeah. All subtle bone fractures potentially. Yeah. Most yeah. Most most often you have. Most often the subtle uh, fractures will be in the wrist, but sometimes you have. Uh, I have had um, shoulders, um, slight you know minor dislocations. Again, coming back to. Um, the images and the referral patterns. Most often, if a GP refers for an x-ray of a shoulder, for example, most often in the um, local rules as such, for the NHS hospitals in specific, you only get one imaging view, so you only get an AP view of the shoulder, which doesn't tell you anything whether the, the patient has any dislocation or any disruption to the shoulder, unless you have an auxiliary view, which is the most, uh, you know, um, of the, imaging um, x-ray that shows up any pathology. So if you've got an AP view of the shoulder, it's not gonna show subtle changes, or only dislocations or anything like that unless you do a second view, um, which is why it's really important to put your clinical indications, put your information as to exactly what you're looking for and why you want what you want. Uh, in the private hospital, um, the protocol is set, uh, and some of the NHS hospitals now as well, actually, consultants have agreed that regardless whether it's a GP referral or an orthopedic consultant referral or, or an uh, you know, external referral, patients have to have three views of the shoulder because otherwise they can't, some diagnosis get missed because one view isn't enough to, to diagnose what they're looking for. But if you just put, I don't know, if you just put shoulder pain, query pathology, well, have, a, have a, an AP shoulder then. You can see a little bit of pathology, but it's it, but whereas if you're more specific and say, um, I don't know, ongoing pain, possible dislocation, you'll get two views. So specify what exactly you're looking for. Even if you're not sure, just put, um, you know, to rule out fracture, to rule out dislocation, to rule out whatever, because then at least uh, they're answering. Because when a radiologist sits down, they've got thousands and thousands of X-rays, MRI scans, CT scans to look at they are only going to answer your question. They're not going to look around the x-ray. So for example, if, if you're looking at query OA, oh yeah, there's OA, extent OA, end of report basically. Whereas if you say a uh, patient has ongoing pain, uh, possible, uh, hist uh, possible OA, but any other bony pathology, rule out, I don't know, rule out tumor, rule out fracture, they're more likely to look at the whole x-ray. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. very much. So. Because it's, um, there was actually a research study done where they put a little uh, picture of a little gorilla in the corner, mm -hmm. and they got a uh, radiologist to sit and look at the reports. 80% of the radiologists that were looking at it, they missed that little gorilla that was sitting in the corner because they're concentrating on looking at answering the question 
they don't look around the x-ray. Whereas we're taught to look at the image as a whole and then put your clinical findings at the end, which includes the impressions and, and your and your diagnosis and then you or you answer the question that's being asked for. But they don't they don't have to time to do that. They just look at it, okay, this is the answer. And most often reports are literally few words. NAD, 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 no abnormality detected. And that's the end of the report. Yeah. So to your trained eye, the first x-ray, is it already showing the tumor? Well, if you look closely, I could so, see it. Yeah, yeah, but look that I was thinking, is it just tumor? Does it actually already show as some? No, if you look closely, you can yeah. actually see yeah. the changes, lytic changes in the bone. You can see it there. Mm. But like I said, because they were concentrated so much on the joint space loss, they just diagnosed it as an extensive um, arthritic changes. They completely missed that change in the lytic bone. Okay. okay. Ready for the next one? Yeah. So, 56 year old policeman with a seven month history of aching hip. Previous medical history unremarkable. X ray. Yay. <laughs> what are you thinking? Yep. Yeah. What can you see? Sclerosis. Superior aspect of acetone. Yep. Anything else? <laughs> I love the word blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Is that information or evidence? Sorry? Is that information now? Um, just the uh, increased density is there, which is probably making it because if there's inflammation, but you know, not necessarily. Patient had, so this was diagnosed as normal. Patient had an MRI scan. What can you see? Uh, different right to left, isn't yeah. it? Yes, mm. yes. It's black wiggly bits yeah. on the left. Yes. And a funny. Yes. No idea what it is, but it's <laughs> <laughs> the prostate metastasis of acetabulum. Mm. But it was diagnosed normal on the x ray. What they can do on the time. Patient still had the symptoms. Yeah, yeah. So I think the pain got worse. So it was just an aching hip pain. But patients started having more symptoms, so they decided to do an MRI scan. Funny, isn't it, how um, one modality just mm. completely normal and the other modality will pick up, which is why it's important mm. to send them for follow-up. If, if you're still, still suspecting something, um, your gut instinct will tell you that the patient... The problem, we're in a good setup because we see patients on a regular basis. I feel bad for the radiologist because they've never come in contact with a patient. They've never examined the patient. They've never taken the case history. Mm -hmm. They're only looking at a piece of paper which tells them, query away, aching hip. Mm -hmm. What they're looking at mm -hmm. is just an image. They don't have any other information in front of them about the patient. Whereas at least we're in a good position. Patient comes back, you you send them, say for example, if that was your patient, you would send them for an x-ray. X-ray would come back normal. Patient still says, mm, he's still having some symptoms. You're concerned the patient isn't resolving. You've done all your best uh, treatment that you've done. Patient's still not responding. You think, well, let me just see if we can do further images. Send them for an MRI scan, and, and, and it appears. Whereas radiologists, they're only going, and then it's up to the person that referred the patient for imaging in the first place to decide whether they're going to refer the patient for follow-up imaging or not. And obviously, in that case, it was, uh, it was done later on because the patient obviously must have gone back to the GP and said, look, I'm still having the symptoms. And they, they decided to refer them for some images. Well, of course, with the x-ray, you don't know what the G question the GP has asked. A lot of patients turn up with mm -hmm. their x-ray report. Exactly. And you, you read it. And that's exactly another a point. I think it's um, sometimes when the GPs get, they actually don't know how to read x-rays. 
Um, so even if the x-rays came back to them, they would have no clue as to what they're looking at. Uh, GPs <coughs> sometimes don't even know what different terms refer to, uh, and they don't actually explain their patient what the actual pathology is. They just tell them, yeah, okay, you okay, your reports come back normal. And often I have patients that come back to me and they bring the report to me, and they say that their GP hasn't explained them anything at all. They just said, oh yeah, there's some... Uh, yeah, some arthritic changes, but nothing, nothing much. But there's actually a lot more in the report that I, I in fact, I had a patient um, a few weeks ago. She had an MRI scan done, and the GP said to her, yeah, just, just wear and tear in your spine, nothing much. She came back with a report and gave it to me, and I said, just wear and tear. There's like, disc bulges at several levels. You've got compression, and just a, just a wear and tear it was because they don't understand the terms that are sometimes used by the radiologists, um, and that's what puts them off. Uh, they don't have time to explain and you know, go into the details of it, so they just say, yeah, it's just wear and tear, basically. Most often it is wear and tear. Or their other favorite word is sciatica. Everything sciatica or wear and tear. Okay, 44-year-old male with long-standing back problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what are we going to refer the patient for? Uh, are we going to refer the patient? Yay, on the same page. T1 or T2? T2. T2? Sure? If I showed you this one, would you change your mind? So yeah, T1 and T2. See any pathology? I had I had a report back uh, by a doctor for a spondylolisthesis. He said it was a mild slippage of just over fifty percent. <laughs> <laughs> so she read the report from the radiologist and right. read it back to me and said, um, "If that's not a grade four, then what the hell is it?" <laughs> Surprising, isn't it? It is, and that's what I mean. It's just. Um, yeah, GP's um, very good at sending patients away. Right, thank you very much for listening. Have I bored you? No, 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 no. no. Very useful. Has it been useful? Yeah. changes in, in the reports, often it's quite difficult for us to decipher the reports and what all these things mean. Modic changes seem to be seen more and more of. Uh, what's the significance what of them? And what, and what are they? Basically you see, um, so are we talking about from the imaging yeah. point of view? So it depends at what stage the imaging was done. If you're looking at some uh, modic changes, sometimes they are changes that happen naturally. Other times they will happen due to a underlying problem. So you've got to basically find out exactly what you're looking for and whether these changes you, you're looking at as a... Are they referring to the disc specifically? Are the modic, modic changes? Is that what you're asking? What modic Mo means? Modic, yeah. Is it is graded changes, is it to the disc or to the end plate or to the whole vertebra? Whole vertebra, sorry. Right. Yeah. But then sometimes, like that, so sometimes these changes are according to, so for example, if you've got an older patient, they're more likely to have these changes as they get older. But if there is, a, if a patient's had a history of um, trauma at a young age, then these changes are going to be um, seen at a younger age 
So you've got to kind of, so it's like the normal variant or right. sort of the okay. changes. So sometimes you'll see these uh, changes in a younger patient, but they're not necessarily um, relating to their age as such, but they are there because of the underlying uh, condition or pathology that they may have had. Okay. Would the um, higher Tesla scanners be better able to pick up early changes in Alzheimer's? That's what they're looking at yeah. now, because which is why they're doing the um, seven Teslas, mm -hmm. so dementias and al Alzheimer's and things like that. So they're more focusing on brain. I'm not sure. They're very, 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 very expensive gadgets. <clears throat> so they, at the moment, they're only for research purposes. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether there will be hospitals that will have be actually be having for them for scanning. But at the moment, three Teslas as good. Is it, is it worth looking with the three Tesla scanner for those early changes? Yeah. Is it reliable? Very reliable. Yeah. So, just one. How sensitive? <laughs> sorry. MRI scans. How sensitive are they at picking up on radicular compression? As in absence of obvious radicular compression, do you, in your opinion, do you still find that these people have still got yes. radicular compression? It's just not visualised very well. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm MRI, I think, is probably the best modality uh, looking at anything to do with your discs, your spine, um, any changes in there, it's very, very sensitive at picking up those. Sometimes you can, like I said, you can do contrast studies if, if there were things that haven't shown up or you're still concerned, you can do contrast studies to make it a little bit more sensitive. The absence of it does not rule it out? No. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.